Oh my goodness. Good morning, good afternoon. Whatever it is for you, I hope you're having a fantastic day. My name is Zach Schaumler. This is Strong Opinion Sports, episode 311. And uh, today I'm wearing a really dark green shirt. I'll be honest, I shamelessly, I decided to pick comfort over look today. Um, I My guess is it's too dark to really stand out against the dark blue background. We're, I'm about to move the studio all around and fix some stuff and make it look better. I don't know if it'll look better. It'll sound better, in my opinion. Um, and so, I don't know. Screw it. I don't even know if I'm going to do any breakouts from this episode, like on YouTube. I think a lot of this is going to be a full podcast, which is, you better listen to the full episode, because I don't know that a lot of the stuff I have to say is going to break into little bite-sized segments. I'm going to kind of go around and ramble and have fun with it and enjoy um, football. I, uh, I want to start today kind of bragging, actually. This has nothing to do with sports, but I'm really proud. I fixed my washing machine. I spent the early part of the week doing that, uh, where I like I pulled it all apart. The drum was all exposed. You know, it lean the top part. The head leans back. You pull it forward. It's like a Kenmore or something. And I looked up on YouTube what, how to do it and what to do, and pulled it all apart using tools. And I, I fixed it. And uh, I just hey, I'm proud. I, I don't want you to know that your favorite sports host, uh, hopefully your favorite. If I'm not your favorite, what's wrong with you? Hey, just kidding. You can like whoever you want, do whatever you want. But I fixed it. I was really proud. I fixed the the washing machine. Uh, I wasn't alone. Uh, shout out to my girlfriend Elizabeth. She helped me. We, you know, she was holding stuff for me and helping me. And but we, she she was actually sometimes even giving me directions because she was watching the video along with my steps doing it. Um, but yeah, fix the washing machine. Kind of my one of my favorite moments of 2020. We're like, yeah, I accomplished something. I'm proud. I did it. Like yeah, like a really, I thought I felt good. I want to dive into sports today. Uh, I want to talk about and this looks kind of good. I'm rolling my sleeve up. Looks shockingly good. It's got the white underneath, and ooh, I like I like how this looks. I wish this shirt was brighter. Like if this shirt was blue, I'd wear it like every single episode because it's comfy. It looks, I think it looks pretty good the way it fits my my body and my cut. Um, but I, I wish it was like a lighter color so I could wear it more often on the podcast. I want to jump in today. Uh, on Sunday, the 49ers beat the Rams. They beat them twenty three to twenty. Uh, the Rams won. It was a close game. It was 20 to 20 with three minutes and 11 seconds left. Uh, both teams actually had a possession at the end of the game. The Rams had the ball. They couldn't do anything. Jared Goff missed a throw or two. I think two throws, uh, the two key throws at the end of the game he'd missed, and they couldn't move the ball. So the 49ers got the ball uh, first and 10 on their own 20-yard line with two minutes and 10 seconds left. And uh, the 49ers' backup quarterback, Nick Mullins, drove him down the field uh, with the help of uh, Debo Samuel. 49ers drove into field goal range. They kicked the game-winning field goal as time has expired. And uh, the 49ers won. They beat the L.A. Rams. A big win because, man, L.A., the Rams look like a playoff team. And the 49ers are decimated by injuries. And uh, I think my number one takeaway from this game, first of all, I'm really curious to kind of see as time unfolds what the future of Jared Goff is. You Remember, he's the Rams starting quarterback. And he's at a weird point in his career where, He's in year five, and he's fine. He's, he's very much fine, right? Nothing, I can't really go, he's awful, he's making terrible mistakes. I can't really harp on that. Um, and I, I wouldn't, like, I, I, he's fine, right? And his job is probably not in danger. He's the starting quarterback of the Rams. He's safe, he feels good, he's solid. And Jared Goff is very, very talented. Um, he occasionally makes a throw that makes me go, wow, that's a, that's a dime. I, occasionally when I watch Jared Goff, I go, woo, boy. That's beautiful. And he's got a great coach. Sean McVay, the coach of the LA Rams, is a great offensive coordinator. He's just a... I think I also like the way he manages people and players. He's like a good players coach. Um, And I do feel like at times, Sean McVay's genius as a play caller, as a coach, as a designer of an offense, as a coach in general overseeing the whole team, occasionally I feel like the genius of Sean McVay gets wasted because he's coaching Jared Goff. There are occasional moments when I go, man, what's going on? How do you miss that throw? How do you do How do you do this? How do you do that? It's not, I can't be like, man, Jared Goff has stretches of his career where he's terrible. It's nothing like that. Like he's, he's nowhere near Trubisky. He's got a way more, uh, a way higher ceiling, way more talent. I see good stuff in Jared Goff occasionally where I go, wow. But I do sometimes stop and think and go, man, does Jared Goff, want to be a great quarterback? Like, what does Jared Goff want? What are his goals? Because he seems happy. He lives in L.A. He's got a nice house. 
Uh, he's got a good job. He's very secure. He's made money. He's Jared Goff is very, very safe. But sometimes he plays like a guy who knows he's very, very safe. And he doesn't appear to be hungry to take the next step forward. I, I, I might be reading it wrong. I don't know Jared Goff personally. Like, I'm not trying to attack the guy. But you certainly, I haven't seen a lot, enough progression and growth from him on the field to go, wow, he's clearly working his butt off, diving into detail, watching film, trying to get better every single week. I, I don't see that. I, I almost feel like there's a, a I, this is, again, I, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm speculating here. It feels like there is a bit of complacency with Jared Goff. He's happy. He's good. He's solid. And I remember a couple of years ago, Joe Flacco, the Ravens quarterback, felt safe. But then he was mediocre for too long, and he got replaced. If you're safe, and you feel safe, that's a problem. I, I, think, I don't think Tom Brady's ever felt safe in his life. I think Tom Brady's always felt like, I have to grind to get after, to keep my spot, to fight harder, and keep going. And I'll never forget, there was a moment when, earlier this year, the Washington football team played the Rams, and Alex Smith played in the game. It's a big deal. Kind of probably the start of his, what will be a comeback player of the year award season for him where he really, he, he came back, he had some good yardage, he did very, very well. And remember, Alex Smith is coming back from a horrific leg injury. And Jared Goff is actually the person that pointed out, I talked about something after that game, but Jared Goff is the person that pointed out. Do you know what Jared Goff pointed out after the Rams-Washington game? He said, Jared said, man, Alex Smith has made a lot of money. He doesn't need to be there. And out, look, Jared Goff's totally right. That's a good assessment. You're like, wow, I mean, Alex Smith didn't need to come back and fight that hard. And, and maybe that means something. Maybe it doesn't. I don't, I don't know. But it's interesting to me that Jared Goff was thinking that in that moment. Because I certainly wasn't thinking, wow, Alex Smith doesn't need to be here. I, I, was, I was inspired by the way he fought back. But I never thought, man, I never, it never occurred to me. Like, well, if Alex Smith doesn't want to come back and doesn't want to play again, he doesn't have to. Why is that what Jared Goff thought? Maybe it's coincidence. Maybe it means nothing. I, I'm, I'm just saying stuff out loud. But why was that in the back of Jared Goff's mind? I don't know. And it makes me curious, where is Jared Goff going to be five years from now? I don't know. Does Jared Goff want to work really, really hard to take a step forward to get to the next level as a quarterback? Is he hungry? Where's Jared Goff going to be five years from now? Is he going to be Joe Flacco? A guy who felt very safe, played mediocre for too long, gets replaced. Is he going to take a next step forward? I mean, I think it's very rare, in a, and it's not. I think it, it is very rare in a quarterback's career after year five to take another big step forward. Usually by year five, you know who they are, and that's what they are the rest of their career. It's it's really hard to keep getting better after that time. It happens. I'm not I'm not trying to say Jared Goff can't get better. But it feels like he's plateaued, and is, I guess I would ask Rams fans is where Jared Goff is, is where he's at right now. If he never gets better from this moment, is that what you want for the next 10 years? I mean, you're not terrible. He's, he's fine with occasionally playing very good, right? That's not the worst place to be as an NFL team. But if Jared Goff doesn't ever get better, again, is that what you want long term? I don't know. I don't have the answers here. I don't know it's what I would want long term. And it certainly would feel like, man, this amazing coach, Sean McVay, has a quarterback who's plateaued, who's not really fighting to keep getting better. And that's just disappointing because Sean McVay, I mean, imagine if Sean McVay coached Patrick Mahomes or a guy with a talent like Jordan Love or Justin Herbert. If he was the coach of the other team in LA with Justin Herbert, oh my goodness, right? There's so much more physical talent there. And I guess I'm just curious, is... I'm asking a question here. Is Jared Goff rich, complacent, mediocre, and happy? How hungry is he to keep getting better? I don't know. I'm asking questions here, but I'm curious to see what's going to happen in Jared Goff's future down the road. Is he going to keep getting better? Is he, gonna, is he just plateaued? Is this where he's at going to be in the, at the rest of his, his career? I don't know. Um, but I'm really fascinated to see what happens in the future of Jared Goff. So the 49ers beat the Rams. And I got a couple thoughts about the 49ers. First of all, Debo Samuel made a huge impact coming back to play for the 49ers. Uh, he's been out since week seven, had a hamstring injury, I believe. I think I'm getting that right. Hamstring injury. I know it's since week seven. 
He had in this game against LA, he had 11 catches for 133 yards. He had a huge play on the 49ers final touch uh, final field goal drive to give them the lead. I guess a game-winning field goal. He had this big play where he caught a slant, ran after the catch, got him into field goal range. He had a couple other plays where, like, he had one play where he was he broke a tackle and made a huge run after the catch. He made some good catches. I, I really, I walked away very, very impressed with Debo Samuel, and I, I really like him. I think he's awesome. Um, and he really, he's great in all aspects of the offense, whether it's running the ball, whether it's blocking, whether it's catching passes. I mean, he really does everything. And Debo Samuel's a name that I think doesn't get a lot of respect around the league, but man, is he an impact player for San Francisco. Now, do you know who the unsung hero of the 49ers is? The unsung hero of the 49ers is Robert Sala. He's the 49ers defensive coordinator, and he does not get enough credit in my mind. And eventually... He's going to get job offers, and eventually there's going to be people saying, hey, Robert Sala, I want you to leave San Francisco. Be our head coach. And personally, I, I hope that Robert Sala, I mean, if I, could, if I control the world, if I was God, I would say, Robert Sala, never leave Kyle Shanahan. I really like them together. They are a great pair. Kyle Shanahan gets a lot of the credit and most of the credit because he's a head coach. But Robert Sala and Kyle Shannon, let's not mince words. They're a team. They work together. Kyle works the offense. Kyle Shannon calls the plays and designs the offense. Robert Sala is in charge of the defense. And man, he's got a sweet gig where, I mean, they're better together. Robert Sala, Kyle Shannon, they're better as a team working together on the same team than they would be separately. And it does feel inevitable that someday these two coaches are going to go their separate way. Eventually, Robert Sala is going to become a head coach, in my opinion. It's going to, it, you, when you're this good for this long, eventually it's going to happen. But I really hope not. I, I really, really hope that, I mean, man, they stay together. It reminds me of the coaches at Clemson. Uh, and I, I think what I'm about to say is going to get aged very quickly because at some point, Brent Venables is going to leave South Carolina and uh, I guess Clemson's where he coaches in South Carolina. He's going to leave and he's going to go be head coach somewhere else on his own because Brent Venables is an incredible coach. But right now, he's the defensive coordinator of the Clemson Tigers. Dabo Sweeney's the head coach. And Dabo Sweeney and Brent Venables together, oh my, they've won national championships. Literally, they're a phenomenal, phenomenal pairing. And Clemson has the highest paid coaching staff in all of college football. They recognize the value of Brent Venables. They pay him to keep him around because he's a great coach. And I really want to see the same thing happen with the 49ers and Robert Sala. Pay him to keep him around. Do not let that guy walk out of your building. He's a great defensive coordinator. He had, I mean, some of the stuff he did against the, or the Rams this week, I went, wow, that's just, it's brilliant. It's, I mean, there's a reason why San Francisco beat the Rams twice this year. LA is a playoff team. San Francisco might have been before the injuries, but man, even with backup quarterbacks and all kinds of injuries on offense, the 49ers defense has stayed really good. And even with injuries on defense, they're still, still really good. Like they're keeping, they're just, they're, they're a really good unit together. And it starts at the top with Robert Sala. And again, both Kyle Shanahan and Robert Sala are better together than they would be separately. But also, I, I would warn Robert Sala. If Robert Sala ever decides to leave and is considering to go, going to be a head coach somewhere, remember, Robert Sala, I would tell you, you're a defensive-minded head coach if you're ever a head coach. You'd be a defensive head coach in a quarterback-driven league. Quarterbacks are you need everything. If you don't have a quarterback, and we've seen a lot of good defensive coaches go, to the, go be a head coach, not have a quarterback, and get fired and not have success. Why is that? Oh, I guess because I guess the quarterback matters, right? But I, I would point out, as long as you're working with Kyle Shanahan on the same team, there's always going to be somebody taking care of the quarterback. The quarterback position is never something Robert Sala needs to worry about as long as he's the defensive coordinator with the same team as Kyle Shanahan coaching. Because, man, Kyle's offenses, they always run the ball very well. That's good for the defense, especially in San Francisco. They run the ball very well. Kyle Shanahan is like a wizard at creating running lanes and running the football. And he learned a lot from Atlanta. 
So running the ball helps their defense. Again, so Kyle Shannon always has good quarterbacks. He's winning games with a backup quarterback, Nick Mullins. He's beating a playoff team, L.A. I, I go, man, Robert Sala, you want to leave? Uh, again, he, I, the longer Robert Sala and Kyle Shanahan stay together, the better it is for both of them. The more successful they will be and the way they will look. If I'm Kyle Shanahan, I'm, I am kissing. I, I'm doing everything I possibly can to be very kind. Of, hey, hey, Robert, you need lunch? Hey, you want to talk? How can, how, I would do everything to keep the guy in the loop and keep him around because, man, he makes your team so much better. And if you're Robert Sala, I hope you recognize, man, you're lucky to be paired with Kyle Shanahan who takes care of the offense. You always have a great offense. You're always going to score points to help your defense. And if I was Robert Sala, you're gonna be. Are you ever gonna be in a hurry to leave the 49ers to leave a great coach like Kyle Shanahan with a good quarterback? Who again? It seems like no matter who plays quarterback there, they're well coached and successful. And you're gonna leave San Francisco for what? The Jets' job? The Lions? Atlanta? Maybe Atlanta. They at least have a quarterback there. I don't know. I I, I really truly believe that Robert Sala has got a good situation, and. It's going to be really hard to find a better situation than he has in San Francisco. They just got to pay him. Pay him more. Keep him there. But I really want to see Robert Sala stay in San Francisco, keep that job, and keep doing it for a long time. I've, I beat this to death, but I, I really, truly believe that. Now, Kyle Shanahan right now, in my opinion, I believe he's the NFL coach of the year. And a lot of people have been saying, well, it's going to be Brian Flores, the coach in Miami, or... Mike Tomlin, who's undefeated in Pittsburgh, or even Sean McVay in L.A., and those are all very good answers, although I would point out that uh, Sean McVay has lost not once but twice this year to Kyle Shanahan, so I, I don't know how you could pick Sean McVay over Kyle Shanahan. It makes no sense to me. So the 49ers are 5-6. and six. They're, They don't have a winning record right now. Uh, they have beat the Rams twice this year, and the 49ers have been decimated by injuries, just plagued with them. And they've played three different quarterbacks this year. Jimmy Garoppolo, C.J. Beathard, and Nick Mullins. I mean, they've had a rotating cast at every position, even quarterback. And it's incredibly hard to win with a backup quarterback, let alone your third-string quarterback, and make that work. And they have. They've made it work to some degree. And, I mean, they beat a Rams team that's likely a playoff team with a backup quarterback. It's so impressive to me. And they beat a Rams team that's a playoff team with practice squad players. Oh, yeah, Kyle Shanahan's doing a great job. And so, in my opinion, if he gets to 8-8, eight and eight, if he has a winning record in San Francisco with what's gone on in, in the 49ers franchise this year, to me, if that happens, if they have a winning record in San Francisco, I go, he's coach of the year. How, do you, how can you possibly dispute that? And even with a losing record right now at 5-6, and six, I still go, that's the most impressive coaching performance I've seen all year. To overcome what they've come, to keep fighting the way they fought, to still be competitive at this point in the year with the amount of people they've lost, I, I just, I really find it unbelievable. And I, I think the best coaching job we've seen all year in 2020 is Kyle Shanahan. And there's five games left. We'll see how it stands at the end of the year. But right now, even with a losing record, Kyle Shanahan is, in fact, my NFL coach of the year as it stands right now. Okay, um, the Steelers-Ravens game finally happened. Six days after it was initially scheduled. Remember, it was supposed to be on Thursday, then Monday, then Tuesday, then yesterday and Wednesday. The game finally happened. It was earlier in the day, like a matinee. If you didn't see it, uh, here were a couple of my favorite moments. It was kind of an ugly game, but these were the moments that stood out to me. Number one, uh, Trace McSorley, the Ravens' third-string quarterback, had a 70-yard touchdown pass. Uh, to Marquise Hollywood Brown. Really cool moment. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Trace McSorley. There's actually a YouTube channel or account, I guess, that always comments on my videos on YouTube saying, hey, I'm like, I kind of pretending to be Trace McSorley. I love it. Um, so, hey, what's up, Trace McSorley? I hope you comment on this video. You're awesome. I love you. Thanks for being around. Um, I also would recommend go listen to the song uh, Trace McSorley by Maddie Fresh. It's fun, it's silly. Look it up. I listened to it this morning. I was like, ah, this is just, I re was reminded, like, oh, yeah, this is really, really fun. And so seeing Trace McSorley, who's kind of a meme, do very well, oh, that, that's awesome. I love that. And I didn't do, didn't do very well, but he had a long touchdown. That, to me, that, that's very cool. 
There was also a fun sequence in this game where... Uh, fun's maybe the wrong word. Interesting, maybe? Crazy? Weird? Odd? Uh, the Ravens had the ball. Second and goal with 26 seconds left before halftime. And they run the ball, they get stuffed, and there's a big pile at the one-yard line. Uh, so, second and goal from the one-yard line, 26 seconds left. They run the ball, get stuffed, giant pile on the ground, and the Steelers just keep laying on the ground. They're like, we're, we're not getting up. They're just laying all over each other, like interlocked on the ground, just like, oh, we can't get up. We're, it's too hard. We're, we can't possibly get up. We're in a pile on the ground. And the clocks just tick, tick. Tick, tick, ticking away. And 20 seconds go by. 20 whole seconds. The clock is down to three seconds before the Ravens can finally run a play. Because the Steelers just literally just laid on the ground, not getting up. And um, the Ravens couldn't snap the ball again. Three seconds left. They snap the ball. They throw the ball to the end zone. It's incomplete. Halftime. Halftime. The clock is run out. It's halftime. And uh, arguably, you can argue that it should have been a penalty for a delayed game by the Steelers' defense. And... I, 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 if, if that had been called a delay game penalty, it would have totally understood. I would not have argued it. I would have been like, yeah, that makes sense to me. But I also didn't mind the no call. And I would say that anybody who's mad about that no call, I would, I would argue with the rebuttal saying that the Baltimore Ravens did a really poor job managing their, managing their timeouts before halftime. I was watching the 49ers Rams game. And going into the final drive for the 49ers, they needed they had like two minutes and 10 seconds left on the clock. They had to drive 80 yards to try to get to the end zone or kick a field goal. And Kyle Shanahan still had all three timeouts available. They had all three timeouts till the final moments when they needed to use them. And so I, I point out that part of football is being able to manage time and managing your timeouts. And before halftime... By that moment, the Ram, the Ravens had wasted all their timeouts. If I said Rams, I meant Ravens. If I said Rams. And uh, the Steelers were smart. They kind of had a savvy move where they stayed in a pile. They made it, They slowly got up as if it was too hard to pull the bodies off of the pile. And I would not, again, I would not have argued if there had been a penalty in favor of Baltimore here. But I also thought it was okay that it was a no call. Partially simply because, man, the Ravens didn't do a good enough job managing the clock and taking care of things. And you decided to run the ball with 26 seconds before halftime on the one-yard line. Like, I is that the smartest thing? Can you at least throw the ball once before you try to run? I, I don't. I don't. I just didn't understand and agree with all the clock management by Baltimore, and so I didn't have a lot of sympathy for them when maybe they got screwed over by the clock. Now this was not the prettiest game. Lamar Jackson did not play. Uh, RG3 started for the Ravens. RG3 was seven for 12 passing. Had. A meager 33 yards passing, uh, no touchdowns, had a pick six through a bad interception, got taken back for a touchdown by Joe Hayden. And uh, the Steelers won. So now the Steelers are 11 0. And a lot of people walked away from this game concerned about Pittsburgh, saying, man, the Steelers, they barely beat Baltimore. Uh, they won 19 to 14. Like, what's going on? And I don't know. Like, my dad literally called me. My dad was like, well, Zach, don't you think the Steelers are not very good? And I'm like, well, dad, no offense. You don't know much of anything about football. Uh, but I, I, my whole thought was, man, the Ravens are, the, A, they're, they're a division rival. The Ravens coaching staff knows Mike Tomlin's coaching staff very, very well. Pittsburgh and Baltimore. These are teams that play each other twice a year for years. And it's been the same coaching staff for years. They know each other intimately. And pretty much any time we get a Steelers-Ravens game, even on a year where one team is bad and one is good, it's always interesting and competitive. They just know each other too well. They'll not have a good game. So that's one thing. You also have to remember context here matters. This was a weird game. When's the last time the NFL played a game on a Wednesday? Can you... I, I don't remember. I, has it happened before? It might have literally never happened before yesterday. So I... It's a weird situation. You got COVID all the time. Had people been practicing? Who was going to play? People the day before got taken off uh, out of the game for the COVID reserve list. It's just a, a mess, right? It's confusing. And I, I think that the Steelers walked away happy they won. I don't think they care how they win. They're like, we won the game. Now, the only big concern, I think, walking away from this game was injuries, where uh, linebacker Bud Dupree tore his ACL. I think his safety got hurt, too. And... Uh, I think it's that's a big loss for the Steelers' defense. They'll be okay, though, I, I hope. 
But where I would be concerned is like in the AFC Championship game against Kansas City, for example, that's where losing Bud Dupree is going to really matter later down the road playing against a really good team where you need every single horse you possibly have in the stable. So it's an unfortunate loss, but I didn't walk away from the Ravens game going, man, the Steelers are terrible. They struggled on offense. They had drops, looked out of sync. They haven't practiced very much. They're playing a team that knows them very well. I don't know. I I really, I don't buy into it. Um, I also think you have to remember part of what makes a good football team is being able to overcome your bad game. Every team has a bad game or two every year. A really great team can overcome the bad game. We see this in college football every year where even the Alabamas and the Clemsons of the world have a bad game where something goes wrong and they're not perfect. But you have to be able to overcome that moment and keep it going. And what I learned from Pittsburgh is, wow, even when they're playing badly, they can overcome that, and they did. Every year, a team, a moment happens where a team plays badly, they're really, really good. We saw Pittsburgh's, and they were okay. They got through it. They won the game. I don't know. I, I look at Pittsburgh and go, they got a great head coach, Hall of Fame head coach, Hall of Fame quarterback, who's still playing pretty well. They, Big Ben is getting really kind of shafted here. People are very much understating how well Big Ben is playing. They've got a ton of weapons on offense. They have, oh my gosh, they have Ray Ray McLeod. They have James Washington. They have, um, what's the name of that guy from Notre Dame? Uh, uh, Claypool. They have Chase Claypool. They have Juju Smith-Schuster. They have uh, two good running backs. They've got a Eric Ebron, a good tight end. It's like, so James Conner, the running back. There's another uh, Benny Snell, the running back. I mean, there's just good players all over that uh, Pittsburgh offense. They've got a good offensive line. They've got a phenomenal defense. Even without Bud Dupree, they're going to be really, really good. So, yeah, I, I just, people keep saying, like, Pittsburgh isn't that good. Quarterback, coach, weapons, offensive line, defense. I don't know how you doubt this team. I just, I go, yeah, they had a bad game. Every team has a bad game. The key is to get through that bad game and win anyway. Oh, Pittsburgh did. So, I don't know. They're 11-0, and and 11-0 and is nothing to sneeze at. I mean, people, for whatever reason, people are like, well, the teams they played are not very good. Yeah, they won. I mean, in the NFL in 2020 during COVID, I think at this point, all I care, I mean, nothing's reliable. Everything's a mess. You have people losing their quarterback the day before a game. You can't trust anything. At this point, if you win, I, I respect that. I don't know why people have this need. I'm not a, I'm not a Steelers fan. I don't give a crap at all, but I, I buy into Pittsburgh because they've won. They're 11-0. There's a reason for that. They're beating teams, and I, I think it deserves more credit than people are giving it, and people just want to say, like, oh, well, they're not winning in the right way. Who cares how they win? They've won a bunch of different ways, which actually is more impressive to me. Some games it's their defense. Some games it's their offense. Some games it's – I mean, it's I, the ways they're winning are different and interesting, and I – I look at Pittsburgh and go, they're a good team, and I respect that. Now, in Monday Night Football, the Seahawks beat the Eagles 23-17. to And first of all, the player of the game, unequivocally, was DK Metcalf, the Seattle Seahawks receiver. He had 10 catches for 177 yards. Really, the big storyline from this game was DK Metcalf. It wasn't a very interesting game, in my opinion. Uh, apparently, before the game, the big story here is that uh, apparently before the game, Philadelphia's defensive coordinator, Jim Swartz, went up to DK Metcalf and said, look, kid, I was in Detroit with Calvin Johnson. You're not there yet. You're not Megatron yet. And uh, Jim Swartz has tried to kind of say he was giving him a compliment. I kind of understand like he's saying, look, you're going to be Megatron someday. Like maybe he just holds Megatron with the utmost respect. I get it. Uh, DK apparently was angry. Like, what do you mean I'm not Megatron? Okay, fine. Let me show you. Like, I, I just stupid. Why Jim Swartz felt the need to say that, I, I do not understand. Um, and so, yeah, the biggest story from this game is DK Metcalf got criticized and then had a big game. Although I don't know it's as big as people really, like, this kind of stuff happens all the time. People talk trash constantly. Um, it just happens that this time you talk trash and the guy did really, really well. So the story gets told, but how many, how many coaches talk trash before a game and the player they're talking trash about has a bad game or does nothing or is insignificant, like happens all the time. So I don't, I don't think it's like the biggest deal in the world. I think Pittsburgh, or I think Philadelphia is really mad. They're like, well, how could you? But I, eh, it's not that big, as big a deal to me as people are making it out to be, but it is definitely the most interesting thing from this game. Now, again, other than DK Metcalf, uh, for me, this was not a very fun game to watch. They had ESPN. It's Monday Night Football. They had the three-man booth. I hate the three-man booth. Timing's awkward. 
Uh, it's, it's like, when are people going to talk? When is it my turn? It doesn't feel right to me. And then the Eagles are just not a very fun football team to watch. Anytime I see the Eagles, there's two teams right now that I, when I see them on the, on the schedule, I go, I don't want to watch that game. It's, well, I guess it's three now. It's Chicago with Mitchell Trubisky. It's the New York Jets and it's Philadelphia. I don't want to watch any of those teams. I just, they're not good. They're not fun. It's not exciting. Um, and there's a lot of bad football being played. Now, on offense in particular, the Eagles are they are struggling with their offensive line. They're, they're struggling with pass protection. they got a ton of injuries. They don't have a lot of talent or weapons. And uh, I'm reaching a breaking point with the Eagles quarterback, Carson Wentz, where I'm just like, I, I don't know how much longer I can keep doing this. I, I don't know. It, it makes me sad. I, I don't know when we're, they're going to give up on him. Carson doesn't look confident. Uh, his fundamentals are a mess. And I'm starting to wonder, when I watch him now, in the back of my head, I'm always thinking, like, can the backup quarterback, Jalen Hurts, do better? Can he do a better job at quarterback? Can he be more accurate? Can Jalen Hurts make better decisions? Probably. And I, I'm, I'm curious, at what point is Philadelphia going to reach a breaking point and put Jalen Hurts out there rather than Carson Wentz? I don't know. Um, I know that Philly is in no hurry to replace their expensive quarterback. I mean, Carson Wentz is under contract at least until next year. There's an out in 2022, but they're also paying him a lot of money. So if they're going to bench him, they're paying him a lot of money to not play. That's weird and confusing. Maybe they trade him. I don't know. But I, I, I personally would be like, let's get Jalen Hurts in there, maybe for the last five games of the year. Now, it's further complicated because they're in the playoff race in the NFC East, which is even weirder. They shouldn't be. They're terrible. Um, but I, I, I just, man, I, I'm ready for Jalen Hurts. I personally, I want to see it happen. Uh, I think you have to figure out what you have so that this off season, if you want to deal Carson Wentz, you can, I'm sure somebody is going to be like, like, I'm sure that the Patriots are like, Hey, we will give you a first round pick for Carson Wentz. I mean, that kind of deal could happen with Philadelphia and they got to decide whether they want to take it or should take it. So I, I don't know. I think you play Jalen Hurts as soon as possible to figure out what he has. But I also guess, I would, I guess, understand you have him in practice every day. So if Jalen Hurts is doing phenomenal in practice, you would think that they would play him. But also politics play a part all the time. So who knows? I do want to say this group in Philadelphia, um, and we'll give a shout out to Nick Foles as well. Nick Foles, Carson Wentz, uh, the head coach, the general manager were like, they had a great year in 2017. They won the Super Bowl. And with Howie Roseman, Doug Peterson, Carson Wentz, uh, Nick Foles played at the end of the year. Is it possible that that's just the best it's ever going to get in Philadelphia? They won a Super Bowl. Times were good. It's awesome. And it's over. I, I, I don't know. I'm asking questions here. It hurts now, but maybe at least they won a Super Bowl. And maybe that's the best it ever was going to be, was that 2017 year where they won it all. I don't know. I, I don't really, I don't have confidence that the Eagles are going to fix what they have. I mean, they're, they're, they've wasted bad draft picks on receivers. They have, their injuries galore. They're aging. Carson Wentz looks like a mess. Is the coach right? I don't know. Um, it's just a lot of stuff is going wrong in Philadelphia. And I don't, I, I don't know that they can fix it with one or two moves. It feels like a bigger change is going to have to happen in Philadelphia. Uh, I think it starts at quarterback Carson Wentz. I don't trust him at all. He's way too inconsistent of a decision maker. Again, I, I want to see what Jalen Hurts has. I think Jalen Hurts is not as physically gifted maybe, but man, Jalen Hurts is a good decision maker and can run the ball. He can run a lot of interesting running game stuff. You probably wouldn't run with Carson Wentz. So I don't know. I'm ready to move on from Carson Wentz, at least for this year, and see what Jalen has. I don't. We need to figure out if the Eagles are going to keep their coach or their general manager. And it feels like a lot of changes are coming very, very soon in Philadelphia. I just I want a change to happen this year now soon so we can see what they have in Jalen Hurts. All right, I'm going to take a short break. When I return, we're going to talk about uh, Tampa Bay and Kansas City. We'll talk about the Patriots surprisingly beating the Arizona Cardinals. And then we'll take a, a break again when we'll do Ask Zach at the end of the show. Uh, I think it's a good question about like 
the Marvel universe. And uh, there's another question I'm really fired up about. Really, it's going to be fun to talk about. I don't know. My name is Zach Schaumler. I'm going to take a short break when I return. We got other good stuff down the road. Hope you uh, stick around. My name is Zach Schaumler. Taking a short break. I will be right back. All right, we are back. Hope we're doing very, very well. Um, on Sunday, Kansas City beat Tampa Bay 27 to 24. The Buccaneers lost to the Chiefs, and it was a very solid game. Now, first of all, I want to say that I just love watching Kansas City play football. They play at such a high level; it's really fun. It's enjoyable, especially during 2020 when you got COVID and injuries. It's not a normal year. There's not a lot of high-level football being played all over the NFL, and so. Watching Kansas City feels like a treat every time I get to do it. Um, and uh, it's, again, because of that unusual year, COVID, injuries, it's hard to make any kind of prediction. But I will say it, it's very likely, and I think I would almost, I, I, I don't want to guarantee, again, you can't you can't guarantee anything this year. I would be shocked if we didn't see Kansas City against uh, the Pittsburgh Steelers in the AFC Championship game in the NFL down the road. Mahomes is amazing. By the way, every time I watch the guy play, I walk away just going, man, this is just incredible. I mean, he does something every game. and Really not something. It's it's how he plays just generally. He's a step above everybody else. I mean, when I watch Russell Wilson or Deshaun Watson, there's an occasional moment where I go, oh, wow. Or an occasion, really, it's an occasional game where I go, Russell Wilson was unbelievable. Or Deshaun Watson was unbelievable. But when I watch... Patrick Mahomes, it's every single week I just go, he did what? How? He makes so many things that are difficult, look just effortless and easy. And he, again, he's just, he's the best quarterback in the NFL, and he's just a whole nother level above everybody. It's just so impressive to watch him every week. And it certainly helps he's on a great team. I'm not trying to say like, again, if Russell Wilson was on Kansas City or Deshaun Watson on Kansas City, I don't know what we'd be saying about them. It'd probably be another thing of, Every week, it's unbelievable, but you have to just give Mahomes credit. He really is the best, and there's a reason why he's hyped the way he is. He's not overhyped. He really just deserves all the praise and ad, you know, admiration and adoration he gets. Um, now, I want to give a shout-out to Tyreek Hill. In this game against Tampa Bay, Tyreek Hill had 13 catches. He had 269 yards, uh, three touchdowns. Just a ridiculous game for him. And uh, Carlton Davis, who's not a terrible corner, was really trying his best. Uh, to guard Tyreek Hill. And often, Carlton Davis had some solid coverage, but when Patrick Mahomes is throwing literal perfect passes and uh, at times, as good as the coverage was, a lot of the time, Tyreek Hill's catches were just even better. I mean, he's like... Sometimes there's moments where Carlton Davis couldn't do any better and it was still a completed pass because it's a perfect throw into a tiny window. Tyreek Hill would rip the ball away. Or, I mean, just... He was winning contested situations so many times. So shout out to Tyreek Hill. Had a great game. And, uh, I mean, he, I just felt bad for Carlton Davis trying to guard him, doing the best he could, and he, he really was no match on, uh, on Sunday until they double-teamed Tyree Kill. Now, Tampa lost to Kansas City, and I don't hold the loss against Tampa Bay because they were supposed to lose, in my opinion. That's a game, like, Kansas City's a better football team. I'm surprised it was as close as it was. It was a three-point game. And right now, the Buccaneers are really struggling with details where, I mean, particularly in offense with the wrong routes or not getting your head around, like on hot routes where there's a play where Antonio Brown, for example, is out of the backfield, just didn't know if they blitz, I got to get my head around and wasn't looking for the ball. Uh, they've got some poor blitz pickup. And receiver Mike Evans is a great example, too, where he's a guy that has really struggled this year with Tom Brady. And a lot of that, in my opinion, is because he's never been asked to do a lot mentally. At least he's never been asked to do this much mentally where there's route adjustments and hot routes and you get your head around and there's all these little intricacies of the game that Tom Brady plays with that I don't think Mike Evans has ever had to deal with. Mike Evans has always been, you know, his game has always been defined by his athletic ability. And so Mike Evans having a hard time adjusting to this offense and to Tom Brady and all the little details that are necessary. He's like, dude, can I just go deep and you throw it up to me? I think there's an element of that that's causing Mike Evans some problems early on. That's why he's catching up and having a hard time with it. But you got to remember, too, Antonio Brown is new, like literally joined a couple weeks ago. Leonard Fournette joined the team late. Uh, right, right, at, Training camp would have been happening. Um, Tampa Bay, they made too many mistakes to beat Kansas City in this game. They lost. I, I was like, yeah, of course. But I will say, I mean, credit needs to go to Tampa Bay. They're ever so slightly very... 
very, it's a slow process, but they are making progress. I mean, they are getting better. Every time I watch them, I go, you know, that's a little better from Tampa. That's a little more this, a little more that. And and the whole narrative that Tom Brady isn't good anymore, I, I just, it's weird. Tom Brady's made some throws this year where I go, I mean, listen to Tony Romo. Literally, literally Tony Romo was talking about that during the game going, yeah, Brady's made some throws this year where you go, I just, that's unbelievable. It's just an unbelievably good throw. Now, there's only four games left for Tampa. They have a bye week, week 13 coming up. The four games remaining for Tampa Bay are Minnesota, Atlanta, Detroit, and then the Falcons again uh, for week 17. So right now, the Buccaneers are going into their bye week. They have time to watch film, make adjustments, you know, get healthier. And uh, currently, if the playoffs happen today, Tampa Bay would be a wild card team. Now, I want to remind you guys, the Super Bowl is in Tampa Bay this year. And if the playoffs started today, the team that Tampa would be matched up against is the Green Bay Packers. Now, remember week six when the Green Bay Packers lost to Tampa Bay 38-10 to when Tampa smacked Green Bay and Aaron Rodgers? I remember that. And so I would not entirely count out Tampa Bay just yet. They were just really competitive against one of the best teams in the NFL, Kansas City. They lost by three points. The Buccaneers keep making progress. Every time I watch them, it's a little bit better. It's still like frustratingly not quite there. But every time I watch Tampa Bay, it's a little bit better every single time. And I know the Saints are 9-2. and two. All the attention is on New Orleans. But honestly, if I'm a Saints fan, I would be hoping that my team doesn't play the Buccaneers again in the NFL playoffs. Because you beat them already twice this year. The last time you beat Tampa Bay, by the way, New Orleans embarrassed the Buccaneers. And it's hard to beat any team three times in one year, but especially when they're angry after getting embarrassed last time you played them. And the Saints also struggle to push the ball downfield with Drew Brees. So call me crazy, and I I have no problem if you want to call me crazy, but the Buccaneers could surprise people in the playoffs. I don't know when they're going to figure it out. I think at some point, I really strongly believe that at some point, Tampa Bay is going to figure things out, play cleaner, and, and make progress and just get over the hump and play really good and beat some really good football teams. And I don't know if that happens this year, maybe not till next year, I don't know. But they have a ton of firepower, they're getting better, they've got a great quarterback, they've got a a solid defense, some good coaching. I just, everyone wants to hate on the coach, everyone wants to hate on this, and people love to hate the Buccaneers, I think part of it's because they have Tom Brady. I'm I'm not a doubter, I'm still, I don't know when they're going to figure it out, whether it's this year or next year, it could be next year, they need an offseason maybe to figure things out. But every time I watch Tampa Bay, they get a little bit better, make a little bit more progress. And so if I'm in the playoffs, the last team I want to play is Tampa Bay. They're so unpredictable. They've got so many good players. I I, I just think, man, if you, especially if I'm a Saints fan, I go, man, does our team match up very well with Tampa Bay? And you might, you might feel confident against the Buccaneers. You beat the crap out of them. I understand that. But if I'm a Saints fan, I go, the last thing I want to do is play Tom Brady in the playoffs with Mike Evans, Antonio Brown, Chris Godwin. Rob Gronkowski, like it's endless the amount of good players they have and they've got some good defenders. So I just think there's enough firepower there with shown improvement every week that at some point the Buccaneers are going to be very, very dangerous as an NFL team. Okay, on Sunday, on Sunday, the Patriots beat the Cardinals 20 to 17. And uh, look, 2020 has been a weird year. COVID has been causing a lot of teams to miss practice and it feels like you can miss randomly just have players miss games and there's been a lot of really really bad football this year as you look around the NFL and good football as a result stands out even more because there's so many bad games being played and bad football everywhere and teams that look unprepared and have missing key players and it's kind of been messy all year and I'm glad we have football it's better to have messy football than no football But again, good football, when I see it, I go, oh boy, it stands out way more now. And the Patriots defense played some really good football on Sunday against the Arizona Cardinals. Uh, Bill Belichick's doing a really good job this year at keeping the Patriot way alive, that discipline they're known for. The Patriots quarterback, Cam Newton, had a weird day. He was 9 for 18 passing, only 84 yards, uh, two interceptions, Cam Newton right now, his best threat is just running the football. He's not been particularly sharp this year. Part of that's because they got no weapons. I understand that. But it was a weird game where New England was actually outgained on offense by over 100 yards. 
Uh, Arizona had 298 yards total of total offense. The Patriots only had 179. The Patriots also they lost a turnover battle. They 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 were just turnovers, inefficient football, some bad throws, some weird stuff happened. Like I was not impressed with the Patriots offense at all. But the Patriots still won the game, and why is that? It's because of their defense. Their defense was awesome. And uh, the Patriots got a goal line stand before halftime where they held Arizona out of the end zone on a fourth and goal from like the six-inch yard line. That was impressive. And the Patriots' defense looks so well coached. I mean, I walked away going, man, Bill Belichick is giving a master class right now in coaching and discipline. And I, I just, I think Bill Belichick actually might be just enjoying coaching this year because there's no pressure. I mean, the pressure's off, expectations are low. It's COVID. So even if you were good, expectations are lower anyway. And so Bill Belichick's just enjoying the game. I mean, I think he's like, go with the idea of winning a Super Bowl. So he gets to just have fun. And I, I think he's the kind of guy who likes working, he likes the chess match of football. So every time the Patriots have played this year, what's fun is watching them. What's their game plan? What are they doing? How are people executing? I, I think Bill Belichick, actually, a guy who I think truly loves football, is just having the time of his life to be able to be carefree, not worry about the pressure of winning and just doing the best he can. I, I think he actually loves it. And the mind of Bill Belichick against Cliff Kingsbury was so much fun, where they kept anticipating what the other one would do. Zone coverage, and then a screen pass would come, and just back and forth, back and forth, what is the other guy going to do? How am I going to react and anticipate what their next move is going to be? And it, I, I just, I, again, the Patriots were so disciplined on defense. You can call a great game, and it's the coach can do all the right stuff, but the players still have to execute. And the players did. They had no big mental errors. Guys were executing at a high level. They were in the right spots. And this game was just a reminder to me that the Patriots' culture is still in place. The Patriot way is still there. And they're going to get more talent this offseason with a a lot of salary cap room to spend. They probably need, I think they need a new quarterback. But this game was a reminder that New England's going to be back at some point. And there's a couple things the Patriots defense did that I really, really liked watching. Uh, A couple times on passing downs, they only had sometimes one or two guys, even in a three-point stance, like the two nose tackles, depending on what set they were in. And the rest of the linebackers and DBs and everybody would just be kind of walking around pre-snap. Like, just just they would walk down to safety, have linebackers milling around, they have these edge rushers just hanging out. And they'd be walking around, intermingling. And what that does, it reminded me a lot of the Steelers' defense, actually. Um, it's What that does is make it hard for the offensive line to know who to block and who's the mic. And what if the mic is, we call it for 54, and then he moves out and he switched places, and now it's the other guy. And it's, it's really confusing to make any kind of calls, and you have to do a lot of zone stuff on the offensive line. And I, I really, I just thought it was so impressive the way the Patriots kept getting pressure and... You know, disrupting Kyler Murray by getting constant pressure because of that confusing front they were running. And then on, on short passing downs, like there was a third and three, for example, where uh, this kept happening a lot on short passing downs where they knew, hey, you're, they're going to throw, they're in an empty set. And Kyler Murray would take the snap and be looking a direction. And if, if he looks left, the guy, the defender on the defensive line on the left would just start jumping, just jumping up, waving his hands around, trying to get into the passing lane while the other side rushes. And, um, one of them was tipped up and intercepted. Like, it's really funny to watch the play where he watches grown man just jumping, uh, swinging his arms all around in Kyler's face, not really trying to sack him, just trying to wait for the ball to come so he can knock it down. And uh, the Patriots also found a way of generating a free rusher off the left repeatedly where uh, what they did is they lined up in both A-gaps. They had a defender in both A-gaps over top of the, kind of right between the guards and the center. That's the A-gap. And then they'd send a rusher through both the B gap between the left tackle and the left guard, and then outside of left tackle and the C gap. And every time what happened was the left guard would cover the A gap, the, the interior defensive lineman. The left tackle would cover the B gap, and it left the C gap wide open. So people just kept coming for free off the left side. And this happened repeatedly every time the Cardinals ran an empty set. That was what the Patriots would call. And... They kept doing it over and over and over again, generating pressure. And Arizona didn't answer. They they kept not they kept leaving themselves vulnerable to a guy coming free off the edge of Kyler Murray. And I'm like, how are you not doing anything about this? It was very weird. And I think a lot of it was because of the confusion up front for Arizona anyway. 
And so, look, I, I just walked away from this game going, look, the Patriots have really no offensive weapons. They have a quarterback who's struggling, who's been subpar. The best threat from Cam Newton is ability to run the ball. But the Patriots' culture of discipline is still there. It's still in place. And after they reload, my, my whole takeaway from this game is, man, at some point, New England's going to be back. It, Bill Belichick is coaching his butt off. I think it's not getting recognized a lot, the things he's doing. And uh, I think Bill's having a lot of a lot of fun, actually. And I, I on paper, you go, New England should not have won that game, but they did. And why did they do it? Because of discipline and Bill Belichick coaching. And I, I just go, man, I, I think that Bill has gotten this far in the air and is still not getting the respect he deserves for how good of a job he's doing in New England. All right, I'm going to take a short break. When I return, I'll do Ask Zach. Uh, what are the questions about today? Let me find. Ah, I don't have them up. I need to get my phone. Uh, I'm going to take a short break. I will be, I will be right back. All right, we are back. Hope you're doing very, very well. It is time for Ask Zach, my favorite part of the show. In case you don't know how it works, you go to patreon.com forward slash Zach Schaumler. You give a dollar a month. That's, again, $12 a year. It's very minimal. But a dollar a month gives you access to submit questions on Patreon. And you can give more if you want to. Please do. It literally helps pay my rent. Um, but a dollar a month gives you access. You send questions on Patreon. Now, if you submit a question, I do not guarantee to read it on the podcast. My only guarantee is I'll look at every single question with my eyeballs. I pick the top couple. I try to read as many as I can at the end of every episode now. I'm trying to do that every episode. I like doing it that way better. And, um... I want to start today with John. No, what am I? So, no, actually, you know what I want to read first is a, there was a fun interaction on Patreon uh, in the chat where Bobby wrote in with an impossible question. He said, what's up, Zach? I know you, this may be a bit of a challenge, but could you say one nice thing about the Jets? I need something to keep me going in these historically dark times. And so I don't have anything positive to say about the Jets. They're a terrible franchise. Uh, maybe that Adam Gase is getting fired, but that's why I want to read Emotep's reply. He said, Change is coming, and that's a good thing, I guess. <laughs> it's, it's totally true. Like, I can't praise the Jets other than to say, like, well, hopefully things change and smile, like, through my teeth. Hope, like, mit, like Wallace and is it Wallace and Gromit? One of the characters goes, like, a big, like, teethy smile. Uh, Bobby, I don't know. I don't have any answer for you, but I thought Amy Otep said it best. Change is coming, and I guess that's good. Now, John writes in and says, Hey, Zach, one last question. If it's too tough to answer, then you don't have to. The holidays are typically... Times of joy for family, but it's, but for some it's not, and it can be a tough reminder or lonely. What was your first Christmas like without your brother? So you may not know, four years ago, my little brother died, uh, almost five years ago now, uh, February 8, 2016. Um, and honestly, this is weird. Holidays have never been a big deal to me. I actually, my first Christmas without my little brother, like it was weird, but I, I wasn't living at home. It wasn't like I was sitting at a kitchen table without him. Like it, I didn't, there, it wasn't like a sense of he wasn't there. You know what I mean? I didn't, I actually didn't probably, it probably handled it better than you would think. Um, the day that was the hardest for me without my little brother was when I got to 100,000 subscribers on YouTube and I was very excited. It was like a big, like one of the highlights of my life. It was a big freaking deal. I was so pumped. And uh, that's the moments I miss my little brother the most are like the highlights where I'm like, man, I wish he could see me now. I wish he could talk to me now. Uh, like when I get married someday, it's going to suck. My brother's never going to see me get married and never going to see that moment. We are so close. And I think if he could see me today, he would love the show. He would love you guys. He'd love Patreon. He'd love all of it. And um, I think he would he would love what I'm doing and feel I – think, I think he'd be proud of me. Uh, and so, yeah, holidays – I wanted to answer that because holidays aren't, I'm not, I don't really like holidays. I'm, I'm kind of neither here nor there. Uh, I've kind of made my own family, my own life where I, a lot of the family I would consider, quote, families, not blood relatives. They're people that I've, I've chosen. And so that's way more meaningful anyway. Um, so that's who I hang out with on holidays anymore. I don't, I don't know. I, but I, I know that the highlights of my life, the best moments of my life are the ones I miss my brother often the most. I always kind of in a dark way, a little bit tainted with, man, if only he could have been here, if only he could have seen that. Uh, and that's that's honest. And John Luke writes in. He says, hi, Zach, love the show. So here's my question to you. <laughs> Your local wizard approaches you and proposes the following deal. 
you will be followed by a crew of Mexican soccer commentators who will do play-by-play with their signature gusto and enthusiasm of your daily life for a week. If you can go the whole week without snapping at them, he will reward you with enormous wealth. The wizard will. However, he also realizes this is quite a difficult challenge and offers you the possibility of inflicting this long t- week was week long kerfuffle upon your most hated enemy. So do you do it, or if you don't, who is the poor son of a gun you're going to be sending this torment to? So Jean Luc. Um, first of all, I like the thought of like he's drinking and he's drinking and he's drinking and he's done. Like I don't know what they would do. Like go, oh! like you know the goal. I don't know what they would do in my life for that. Like uh, there's a fun thought that I can't say on this show. I'm, I'm sure there's like some moments where like they would honestly, I don't think it'd be that annoying. And I think it would be annoying after a while, but I, I read this question and went, man, sounds like an easy way to get rich. I went like, I mean, it'd be weird. You'd give up your privacy. Like I imagine they're watching you shower. Like they're always there, right? They're always creepily around. Um, and you have no privacy for, your, for a week. You have people yelling at you. Like I'd be doing the show and this, these Mexican dudes speaking Spanish would just be talking behind me. It would make no sense. And I'd be like, look, it's a week of this so I can get rich. I don't care. Um, so if that was if that was ever a possibility, I could handle that no problem because it's like, well, the reward is worth it, right? I I think I'd do way, like, I'd do way harder things to get rich. Like, you know what I mean? I, I, like, I would happily do way harder things if it's like, hey, if you do this one thing, you're going to be incredibly wealthy afterward. You know I mean, I'd buy a property in Hawaii. I'd keep doing strong opinion sports to give away the extra wealth to the youth of Hawaii. And that's what I, I just, I want to live in Hawaii. That's what I want to do someday. And I absolutely, I would do that. Now, uh, so yeah, if I had Mexican dudes yelling Spanish in my ear uh, as if they were soccer commentating my life, I, I could do that. I think no problem. It'd be annoying. Uh, and again, the privacy part would be the weirdest part of that. But I, like, whatever. Like, I, if I know I'm going to get wealthy afterward, yeah, I'll do it. I'll put up with it. Um, and I don't really have any enemies. I don't really wish ill on anyone. So there's no one I would... Also, like, if it's your enemy and you give them that, do they get the money too? You know what I mean? Like, I don't know that I wish on anybody and I I don't know that I wish ill on anybody. So I, yeah, I don't know. I don't think I would give it to anybody. I think I would just take it for myself and say, ah, give me that money when it's over. Uh, Carter says, where do you think Detroit should send Stafford? So this is a, a lot of people have been asking about this. I, I chose Carter's here because Carter's was the most fun to answer where, a lot of people are saying, where do you want Stafford to go? That's not what this question says. Where should Detroit send Stafford? So I want to see Matthew Stafford go to like Pittsburgh or New England. because That makes sense because they're an NFC team trading to the AFC. I'd love to see him in San Francisco with uh, Kyle Shanahan. That'd be amazing. Like watching Kyle Shanahan coach Matthew Stafford with that roster. Oh my gosh, it'd be terrifying. But also, the Lions shouldn't worry about anything other than themselves. So where should the Lions trade Matthew Stafford? They trade him to the highest bidder. I mean, like, whoever gives you the most and the biggest haul is where you send Matthew Stafford. Worry about yourself. Whatever the highest amount of draft picks or the best players you can get, that's where Detroit should send Matthew Stafford. Who cares if it's anybody? As long as it's uh, probably not a team in your division. But you trade Matthew Stafford anywhere that people are giving you the highest amount of stuff for. Does that make sense? That doesn't... I don't think Detroit has to worry about, is it going to work for Matthew Stafford? They need to worry about, is it going to work for us? What are we getting in the deal? So that's what Detroit needs to worry about themselves, not about the rest of the NFL in this move. And a lot of people kind of seem to be forgetting that as they uh, send me questions and DMs. It's, I want to live in the fantasy world of where is Matthew Stafford going to go? I'd love to see him, uh, like, again, Pittsburgh, New England, San Francisco, right? That'd be awesome. The reality is he's probably going to go to some crappy team that, like, uh, that uh, the, the the Cowboys, right? That's not even a good answer because they're in the same, uh, they're in the NFC as well. But he's going to go to a team that's kind of anticlimactic, probably. And that's unfortunate, but that's, that's all honest. I mean, uh, maybe he goes, maybe the Jets trade for Matthew Stafford, something like that, right? Like, a team where, like, uh, a team where we all grown, I would love to be proven wrong. I'd love to have Matthew Stafford go to a team where I went, yes, I'm so happy. That's an amazing trade. I feel so good about it. But I don't know that that's actually going to happen. I I don't have a lot of optimism that we as fans are going to get the trade we are hoping for with Matthew Stafford. Okay, Kenny writes in, says, hey, Zach, if you could only keep one of your five senses, which sense would you keep and why? Would it be sight so you could keep watching film or did we taste so you could always have the glorious taste of Chex Mix hitting your taste buds while you work? 
Let me know. He says, for me, it's sound. As a musician, if I lost my hearing, I would go insane. Thanks, Kenny from Cal. Thank you, Kenny. Love you. I appreciate you. So what sense would I keep? So I've gotten this question, I think, before maybe saying something like, what if you lost one of your senses, right? And losing one of your senses is way less of a big deal than losing four. Four is a big deal. So the five senses are sight with your eyeballs, sound with your ears, hearing, smell, that's smelling stuff with your nose, that's taste with your tongue, and also probably part of your nose, and touch with your hands and with everything, right? Every nerve ending that can touch and feel. So first of all, if I lost four of my five senses, I have no idea how I'd make money. I feel like it'd be kind of useless where... I guess that's maybe the question though. Am I, am I paralyzed with like, can I just see, can I move? Can, like, can I touch stuff, but I can't feel it? So can I still drive a car even if I can't feel anything? I don't know. Cause with my, if I had eyeballs, so I would keep my eyes, right? My, our eyes are actually, I think kind of underrated as a sense. They're so important. They're so valuable. And we treat them kind of like crap. I think that you, you have to really value your eyeballs and keep them healthy and um, wear sunglasses and protect your eyes, right? At all costs. And we're very cavalier, like, oh, our eyes are going to be there forever. Well, if you lose your eyes, there's not really, it's one of the few things in your life, if you lose it, you actually cannot replace it, like, at all. Like, you're just not, you, you get two eyes your whole life, and that's that's pretty much it. Uh, I think we should actually be a little bit more defensive of our eyeballs. Um, but can I, if I talk, like, if I lose four of my five senses, all I can do is see things, right? Can I still talk? I just can't hear it. Like, and then could I do my job if I couldn't hear myself? I don't know. At least I could, at least even if I couldn't do a, a podcast anymore, if I could still talk, because hey, like, you know, it would sound, you wouldn't know how, what pitch you're hitting, so it'd be hard to know what you're saying. But if I could get a sentence out, at least I could communicate with the world and operate a little bit. Uh, or I could just always, see, if I have no feeling, can I still write stuff with paper? I don't know. Because I could still see on the paper, like, what I'm writing, so... I don't know. It's a confusing question. I know that if I could use my eyeballs and I could still use my hands, I just couldn't feel what I was touching with my hands. Um, I'd be able to watch football. I'd be able to do a lot of stuff. I'd be able to, uh, I could play video games. I could read. Um, now I don't want to lose any senses. I value my senses. I'm very happy. Uh, I, I will say if I could give up one or two, you can take smell. Most of the smells I smell are terrible anyway. Like I like cat poop smells horrible. I don't need to smell that ever again. And if I lose the bad smells, I may lose the good smells, but how much do I smell something? I go, wow, what a comforting smell. Usually when I notice a smell, it's negative, not positive. Um, and you can even take taste. I mean, let's be totally honest. I, I bet I would lose weight. If I couldn't taste anything, I probably would stop eating for pleasure and comfort. So I'd probably just eat way less. I'd probably only eat to survive. So I'd be eating it'd be more uh, robotic and more out of duty and sense of obligation than it would be because I want to eat because it's fun. It's probably be good for me. I'd probably lose weight actually if I, if I lost my sense of taste. And if I could just, you know, hear, see, and touch, then I could do my job, watch movies, play video games. I don't need smell or taste really at all to operate as a pretty functioning human being. Like I like tasting things, right? But I think if I, if I never taste it again, I, it would probably just make me healthier. So... I, I don't know. I'd miss food. It'd probably help me lose weight. Um, and uh, I, I just it's in, an interesting thought. Like, sight is my most valuable. A lot of people can operate. Sight is the one thing they've lost, and they're fine. I don't want to learn how to read Braille. I don't want to do audiobooks. I love watching movies. And if I could watch a movie, uh, that'd be awesome. So, but definitely, if I, if I couldn't keep eyesight, then I would definitely keep hearing. Because then you could listen to podcasts and movies and you know, listen to audiobooks, I mean, and I don't know. I, I just, as long as I, I would want to keep a, like a sense that would allow me to still be entertained. My whole life centers are on entertainment. I love entertainment. And uh, that's what I would want to, to have left. Final question. Landon writes in, he says, thoughts on the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So there's no word, no guide. In fact, if anyone listens to this question, they're like, hey, I want you to talk more about X, Y, or Z. Like, Feel free to write in more about movies or the Marvel Cinematic Universe, whatever. Like, if you hear me say something, you're like, I want you to expand on that, write in. I'll do my best to do it. Uh, but generally, about the Marvel Cinematic Universe, um, I love Tony Stark. I think Tony Stark's a great character, well-written, compelling. Uh, I thought Spider-Man was great. Like, Tom Holland's awesome. And 
bring in Spider-Man made things more fun, and I, I liked the whole sequence. Um, my two favorite MCU movies are, I think Thor Ragnarok is unbelievable. It's so funny. It's actually, if there was one MCU movie alone and forgetting the rest, that's one. that one and Black Panther are probably the two that could stand alone the best. Um, I love the director of Thor Ragnarok, Taika Waititi. He's from New Zealand. He's phenomenal. Uh, my second favorite MCU movie is Black Panther. It's a really great movie. Uh, I'm sad, you know, that uh, the Bozeman's gone. It's going to be terrible. Um, Marvel's cool. It's not my favorite. Um, I personally, I, I Green Arrow's my favorite superhero. Batman's great. Uh, I, li- I do like dark and gritty mostly, but I will say what the MCU nailed, DC can't find the right tone. They're all over the place. MCU was like, here's our niche. We're fun. It's a good time. It's lighthearted. And being fun is key. People like fun movies. And, and that's what the MCU really is. It's not dark and gritty. It's just a good time. Um, I also, I loved Endgame. I, I think that that two part, was it, was it two? Was it four? The Avengers movies were awesome. Like they were just a good time. Um, I thought Professor Hulk and Endgame, like Professor Hulk was all fat. Uh, I guess that's Fat Thor and Professor Hulk together in that, you know, they're playing Fortnite. I thought it was awesome. I, I really, I, I enjoyed that a lot. Um, and then again, I go back to, as I think around the MCU, like I come back to Robert Downey Jr. Robert Downey Jr. was just so great as Tony Stark. Like he's the face of that franchise. And uh, I, uh, RDJ, man, I he was a great Sherlock Holmes. He was um, a great Tony Stark. And uh, I really, I mean, I'm sad we're not going to get more Tony Stark. Because I think that, I mean, even the bad, the mid, I think the second Iron Man movie is probably the most weird and not as compelling but any one of those movies you sit down and watch you get sucked into an iron man movie like that it, it's so good it's so interesting and uh yeah that's all i have to say about the mcu unless you ask me about more but um i think who plays vision i was watching some movie recently where the actor who played vision i don't think it's paul i don't think it's and maybe it's paul bettany but i don't think it's paul bettany maybe it is paul bettany Whoever plays Vision has been in a couple other roles, and I went, oh, that's impressive. Huh. Wow. Big deal. I think it, maybe it is Paul Bettany. I don't remember. Paul Bettany from, um, God, what's he in? He's in, he's, I think he's in The Da Vinci Code. He plays, like, that priest guy who's, like, the assassin. He's in, um, God, what's that, Margin Call? Uh, that's a good movie. Zachary Quinto. I'm just rambling now. But, uh, I guys, I got to go. I love you. I appreciate you. Hope you have a great day. I'll see you tomorrow. Got a fun episode tomorrow. We'll do NFL predictions. We'll do all kinds of stuff. My name is Zach Schaumler. I'm going to guess not take a break. I'm going to go. I'm going to go uh, edit this podcast and, and watch more football tonight. So I love you. Hope you have a great day. But um bum bam we are. By the way, as you're listening to this, know that it takes me about four hours to get it uploaded. So I'm in the middle of watching the Giants Bengals. I'm going to be watching. Um, I want to watch the Bills Chargers game tonight. So as you're listening to this, do be aware, I'm watching football this very moment. Love you. Have a great day. Ba-dum-bum. Bam, we are.